So good morning, welcome back after the coffee break. My name is Franco Molteni. Uh, I work in the research and Copernicus departments of the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast. Um, I have two lectures uh, in this week. Uh, the first one is uh, a joint lecture with David. And <clears throat> it will cover topics um, which are broadly similar to what Angel has discussed in his previous lectures. Uh, but as David anticipated, more from a, a more sort of large scale and historical uh, point of view. So again, uh, the main purpose is to give some foundations to understand how um, we can use circulation regimes uh, to understand or to interpret tropical, extratropical interactions. And first of all, let's talk about this concept of circulation regimes. Uh, because this word is used uh, in slightly different flavors, and it can sometimes be uh, a bit confusing. Uh, the idea of circulation regimes actually was mainly developed uh, theoretically in the late 70s and the 80s, 1980s. And it actually came from um, sort of a way of interpreting uh, observations which have been occurring uh, for a long time about the fact that there are some patterns in the atmospheric circulations which uh, seem to be particularly persistent or recurrent. Recurrent means that they come back uh, quite frequently. And to see some example, you can look uh, at the three maps in this slide. Uh, these are all uh, maps of five-day means fields of 500 hectopascal geopotential height during uh, the winter in the Northern Hemisphere. So, uh, for example, in this first map, uh, you can see that the, 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 the flow is, it has very strong waves, uh, a very strong ridge over the Rocky Mountains, big trough um, over eastern Canada, a blocking high, uh, big over uh, Central Europe, and then uh, again a sort of blocking high here north of the Caspian Sea. Uh, so overall a very wavy pattern. If you look at the second map, uh, you can actually see that this wavy pattern is, is, is still present, uh, perhaps with some changes. You, uh, you know, this high is actually now in, in a more easterly uh, position here over, over the North Sea. Um, and so, in fact, you, you see clearly the sort of typical dipole structure associated with European blocking. Um, for the rest, uh, um, the flow in, in the Pacific uh, uh, remains quite similar. <clears throat> when we now move to, to the third map, uh, uh, again, the dipole uh, over Europe is, is present with the blocking, uh, the trough over eastern Canada, but now the flow it's a much more zonal structure here in, in the Pacific, and the strong ridge um, has actually disappeared. So um, from the way I talked about this map, and it's a bit of a trick here, I described this map as if they were a time sequence of consecutive maps. But actually, these maps occurred, each one, uh, in a different winter. So what it shows is that if you compare these, these, these two flows that actually occurred one year after the other, you, you can see they are remarkably similar from a large scale point of view. Um, and if you compare this with this one, again, one year difference. Um, and if you just now focus on the European and Atlantic sector, uh, then again, you see this blocking structure looks very much uh, the same. So a number of, of uh, uh, people have actually looked uh, at this um, phenomena from an observational point of view, for example, Jerome Namayas for the um, Pacific uh, uh, anomalies or, or uh, Rex, Legionnaires you know, in Oakland, they look at the um, European blocking. Um, and so they, they noticed this characteristic of some patterns to uh, repeat themselves in, in, in time. <clears throat> 
Um, and so in the, uh, in the late 70s and 80s, there were a series of um, papers about large-scale dynamics that tried to uh, interpret and explain uh, the recurrence and persistence of, of these patterns. Um, nowadays, we mostly uh, refer to, to this pattern as either circulation regimes or weather regimes. Actually, there's, uh, there's actually a sequence of dynamical concepts which are strictly uh, related. Now, if we talk about weather regime, we usually mean a, a persistent or recurrent large-scale atmospheric circulation pattern which is associated with specific weather conditions on a regional scale. This is what Angel has shown. So, so you may have a circulation pattern that determines, for example, the patterns of precipitation. And uh, the same thing is for the North Atlantic Oscillation. You know, the different phases move the precipitation from Northern Europe to Southern Europe or vice versa. Actually, the weather regimes are an application to the atmosphere of a more general concept, which is the flow regime. So you can have a lot of geophysical fluid dynamic systems, even you know, very uh, simple ones, um, that actually have uh, an, an attractor which is complex. So there are parts of the phase space of these attractors that are more populated than others. So again, some preferred states of, of, of the flow that are quite different from each other, and each of them is, is quite persistent. There's a, a famous um, analog, for example, in a rotating annulus with uh, some bottom uh, obstacle that can either be in a zonal flow or in a very wavy flow, and you will find this example in many fluid dynamics books. Even more general is the concept of multiple equilibria, and basically whenever you have a nonlinear dynamical system, uh, for some values of, of the forcing parameters in this model, you may actually have multiple stationary solutions. So there will be a number of um, configurations where the dynamical tendency will vanish, will be um, zero. So in some sense, you, this is perhaps the simplest concept, just looking for a stationary solution of instantaneous equation. Uh, here you look in general to basically parts of the attractors that are more populated, and basically the, the weather regime is the application of this concept to the practical atmospheric flow, um, including the effect of baroclinic uh, transients. So in terms of the dynamics, uh, the, these papers uh, were mainly uh, describing regimes as quasi-stationary states of a simple equation that uh, were just described either by the barotropic vorticity equation or basically for an equation that described the evolution of quasi geostrophic potential vorticity. So uh, in, in practice, you, you, Q in this equation is, uh, is the potential vorticity. And basically, this equation can be simply stated that uh, the vorticity is just advected by the non-divergent flow. And you can actually derive the non-divergent flow from the potential vorticity itself. So you have two variables here, but actually they are linked um, one to the other by a linear relationship. So if you know Q, you know uh, the divergent wind. And then you have some dissipation processes, which are usually uh, linear in many models. They have the effect of relax the potential vorticity towards some sort of uh, equilibrium. For example, you can imagine uh, that in the absence of forcing for the waves, the system will relax to a zonal uh, configuration. So uh, in a multiple equilibrium approach, you just look for steady states uh, of the instantaneous flow. OK, as, as I predicted, the pointer is disappearing a bit. So look, let's look here. So you can just set the time derivative in this equation to 0. And then you can look for instantaneous stationary states of, of this equation. So this equation is nonlinear because you have the product of wind times the gradient of potential vorticity. And so it may admit multiple steady states. And one can look for them. But um, yeah, in the concept of, of regimes, uh, we are actually thinking at least for the atmosphere uh, and at least in, in these kind of papers, uh, they were mainly trying to explain persistent anomalies. So persistent on a time scale of maybe 10, 20 days, even one month, perhaps. And so uh, if you do that, you should not just take the instantaneous flow, but average 
uh, this equation over a, a typical time scale, let, let's say uh, 10 days. And um, if you do that, uh, you basically can rewrite this equation where you have some terms where you just replace the instantaneous flow with the time average flow. And then because of the nonlinearity, you actually have an additional term which comes from the nonlinear interactions of all the variability which has basically a shorter period than the period on which you are actually averaging. So typically, if you are averaging over 10 days, our clinic waste with a period of a few days will basically contribute to this term, which has sometimes been referred to a transient forcing or eddy forcing in, uh, in these papers. So uh, these are some uh, brief list. It's not exhaustive, um, but uh, just quote some of the papers which are uh, being quoted more, more frequently um, about uh, multiple equilibrium and quasi-stationary states in, in simple models. Uh, perhaps uh, one that is usually quoted as, as a starting point from this investigation is uh, the paper by Charney and Devore in 1979, um, where the authors look for multiple equilibria. Um, what you see here are actually the titles of, of, of the papers. Uh, the Charney and Devore paper was about trying to find multiple equilibria in a simple barotropic uh, model uh, of a channel flow with bottom uh, sinusoidal, sinusoidal topography. And they point out that uh, basically some of the stationary states corresponded to different intensity of the zonal flow and the amplitude of planetary waves. David was working with, with Chani at, at the time and um, in, in another very famous paper in 1980, uh, they extended the analysis to uh, a baroclinic two level quasi geostrophic model, and they looked again for um, multiple equilibria of, um, of this model. Uh, this model was more complex and had more uh, equilibria, and, and of course, if you want to know more, David is here, and you, <laughs> you can ask for, for more details. Um, Charney, Shukla, and more return to barotropic uh, theory, but they put uh, many more degrees of freedom in the barotropic model, the channel level paper uh, was based just on a reduction to three degrees of freedom. Uh, Legrand and Gill, again, using a barotropic model uh, with many degrees of freedom, and they actually, in this case, look at the complex attractor, uh, but with uh, strong uh, persistent states. Um, and then uh, the Italian school came uh, with a different um, proposal for multiple equilibria based not so much be, um, on the interaction between the zonal flow and the waves, but rather by some non-linearity of the wave itself, which allowed uh, multiple equilibria. And this particular theory came as a response to some observational studies that Sutera was doing at, at the time, started at uh, ECMWF and then he continued at Yale, that actually he could not find any evidence of multiple equilibria in, in the zonal flow, which would contradict the Charney and, and the Vogue theory, while he could find um, evidence uh, in the structure, in the amplitude of, of the planetary waves. Uh, all these models were basically um, orographically forced models. So there were simple models with some usually simple sinusoidal, sinusoidal topography at the bottom that would provide forcing for the planetary waves. But of course, um, and these were all models of the northern extratropical circulation, mainly during winter. Well, during winter, topography is not the only forcing for planetary waves. Another important forcing is the land sea thermal contrast. And uh, so there was another uh, group of papers, and the first one was the one by Mitchell and de Rome in 1983. So they did a similar study, but in this case, the forcing for the planetary waves was not an orographic forcing, but a thermal forcing due, induced by the Lancy contrast. And I, I will return to this thermal equilibration theory later on. Now, all, um, in all these models, again, the, uh, the nonlinearity was just basically due to nonlinear interactions between the large scale flow. It could be the waves uh, uh, and the zonal flow, or the waves themselves. Uh, but there was no specific role for the uh, high-frequency baroclinic waves. 
So the concept of weather regimes as it is uh, interpreted now uh, can actually be traced to um, other papers when the, the baroclinic high frequency waves were explicitly taken into account. And the first one is the one by Reinhold and Pierre Hambert in 1982. Uh, they took the Charney Strauss model and they added more uh, degrees of freedom in the baroclinic range. And so uh, in this case, what happened is that instead of just having this stationary uh, solution, some of them were actually uh, uh, fixed points in, in, uh, um, in Charney's and Strauss paper, Basically, the, uh, the baroclinic waves interacted with this large scale flow, and they created regimes in which the, uh, the state of the system was actually orbiting around the stationary states for a while and then moving to uh, another state. And so, uh, these, for example, are some uh, examples of uh, um, the various uh, regimes that, um, that were found. Uh, and um, one of them, for example, this one they refer to as, sorry. Yeah. Uh, they call the Hadley equilibrium, you know, the flow is, is zonal. And then they, they talked about two uh, regimes uh, that were, in fact, quite similar to the ones found by Charney and Devo. They referred to as the trough equilibrium or the ridge equilibrium, because these were states with uh, uh, well developed planetary waves. In, in one case, uh, the ridge was located over the mountains, and in one case, the trough was located over, over uh, the mountains. So this actually was uh, an hemispheric model. It covered, so the idea was to explain the whole, uh, basically, uh, hemispheric circulation. Um, a similar paper was published in 1988 by Votard and, and Legras, and they were actually concerned with just explaining what happened downstream of the maximum of the, of the jet. So uh, the, the goal was to explain uh, the variability and flow regimes in a particular sector. In, in this case, they had mainly the Atlantic in, in mind. So what they did, again, they had a channel with a baroclinic level model, and they just imposed um, a thermal forcing that would create uh, basically an <coughs> intensification of the jet at the beginning, basically on this left side of the channel, and then they look what happens downstream of the maximum of, of the jet. The difference with respect to the Reinhold and Pierre Hamburg paper is that the last scale flow in this case has no multiple equilibrium. But still, because of the interactions between uh, the various scales in the model, and in particular uh, the, the feedback of the high frequency transients, basically they could have uh, one regime where the flow was almost zonal, one with an intermediate wave amplitude or a slightly perturbed zonal flow. In fact, they call them zonal two. Uh, and then uh, one third equilibrium where the, the flow uh, created a strong dipole with uh, actually an inversion of the zonal flow, and they call this a, a blocking. So um, somehow the, these two uh, papers um, describe the characteristics of the different approaches that were taken. In one case, people were looking at the large scale planetary circulation. Um, and how basically they responded to uh, forcing related to geography, like you know, the mountains or the Lancy contrast. Uh, in the other case, somehow uh, the effect of, of this forcing was just so to produce a mean state, that would be the only stable solution. But because of the interaction with the eddies, then you could still have uh, multiple um, regimes. Now, in terms of observational evidence, of course, these are all models. A uh, good question is what happens if you look uh, in the observation. And uh, I mentioned uh, already that uh, Sutera started looking uh, for uh, observational evidence. And if you, um, the simple idea is that uh, if you have a model where part of the attractors are more populated than others, uh, then if you look at the probability density function of the states of this model, they, this, this probability density function should differ from a simple multinomial distribution, but possibly have multiple peaks, uh, multiple modes, uh, corresponding to the different regimes. Uh, so uh, in the models where basically the, the main um, 
difference between the different regimes was the amplitude of the planetary waves, then uh, this would suggest to look for evidence of multimodality in an index of the planetary waves. So, so this was what Stere did originally, and uh, he expanded this approach in a paper with Hansen in 1986. And um, he used the, at the time, uh, um, NMC analysis, now we would say the NCEP analysis, uh, to look at bimodality. He was looking for bimodality in the, prob in the probability density function of uh, a combined amplitude of planetary waves. And uh, because the theory tells you that this, uh, multi these regimes occur because of uh, basically uh, variability in waves which are near quasi-stationary, they only use uh, the zonal wave numbers which theory tells you are quasi-stationary um, in, in the northern hemisphere winter circulation. And they restricted so their analysis to uh, zonal wave numbers two to four. Uh, they chose one particular band of latitude, so they averaged the wave amplitude in this latitude, and they computed these probability density functions. And you can see them on the left hand side. These are basically um, uh, examples with a slightly different time filters. And uh, you can see that uh, these, uh, these functions are not unimodal, they have two bumps, especially this one. Now, there's been a lot of debate about the statistical significance of this bimodality, whether the smoothing was enough, whether the sample was large enough. Some people have confirmed Hansen and Sutera results, some people have disputed Hansen and Sutera results. There's, there's all literature about this, so I don't want necessarily to, um, uh, no, <laughs> to go very much in this debate. But uh, recently, um, David actually uh, tried to uh, sort of compute a planetary wave index that was a bit more uh, general. And uh, the results are actually uh, in, a, in a paper that has come out in a, in a recent book published by Cambridge University Press. And so this is the specific recipe. You, know, you can follow this recipe if you have a set of reanalysis and, and compute yourself. Um, this, uh, um, this index. So you take, for example, daily fields of geopotential height uh, for the winter period for a, a large set of, of winters. Uh, as we said, you know, we are now looking at large scale regimes on a time scale longer than the planetary wave. So you want to first filter out the high frequency variability. Uh, then you do a space filter, so you only uh, retain uh, the large scale waves. And in some cases, David tried to be uh, you know, more uh, general and less restrictive, so include uh, wave number one to five. Um, then you, you do your average over a certain band, and, and David chose 55 to, to 65. That, in fact, is, is latitude where you have the largest uh, amplitude. Uh, then you, you, you combine, you compute the root mean square amplitude of this, uh, this profile. And this root mean square amplitude is a single number that will basically is your index uh, for the planetary waves. So once you have this um, data set, you have to uh, remove uh, the seasonal cycle because, of course, you know, the wave amplitude has a seasonal cycle. You are left with an, uh, um, uh, an anomaly. And then you can compute a histogram showing how many times uh, the planetary wave index lies within a given range of values. And, and you can also estimate a smooth probability density function based on, on this data. Now, if you do that, uh, that's what David found. Um, and uh, again, you, you may question whether uh, this dip uh, uh, is significant or not. Uh, so whether you should say that this distribution is uh, um, bimodal or unimodal, depending on your smoothing. So if you try to fit a very smooth solution, you will get the dotted line. Uh, the histogram are actually these color bars, and a sort of intermediate smoothing gives you uh, the solid line. So uh, this somehow shows a, a problem which has always been debated uh, when we try to find the regime. So, um, how much I should aggregate the data, how much should I smooth them, and how much should I filter. There's a whole literature on, on that. And again, we, we, we cannot just uh, go through all of this. But uh, um, 
This is basically one way of trying to condense everything in one single number. Of course, you could say, well, what, why one single number? Can we do a, or maybe just two? And um, so this, uh, you can certainly do that. And in this case, one approach is to use, as Angel mentioned, the uh, first to do uh, an EOF analysis of the flow you want to analyze. And then you just look at the leading principal component. So this is, um, is a study I did with uh, Susanna Corti and, and Tim Palmer, uh, published in 1999. We looked again at the planetary scale flow. Uh, we look at the first two principal components. And uh, uh, you can actually uh, use um, non-parametric estimates to compute the two-dimensional probability density function. And if you do that, again, with some intermediate smoothing, uh, you basically find the structure with three maxima. And these three maxima correspond to these three particular uh, anomalies. Uh, these two anomalies have opposite uh, sign both in, uh, in sorry, both opposite sign in the, uh, in the Pacific and North American sector, but both have a positive projection on the North Atlantic oscillation. The third regime is a negative North Atlantic oscillation. So basically, in this direction, you change the North Atlantic oscillation. In this direction, you change the, the Pacific structure. Um, but you can do that sectorially. And, and David, again, in the same article, has done that for the first two pieces of uh, just North Atlantic variability. And again, he did that with different smoothing. So uh, actually, uh, he did it using the first three. So in this case, you can actually see uh, plots of two-dimensional PDS using different combinations. So on the left, you see uh, uh, a PDF. Uh, uh, where x is the PC1 and y is PC2. Second plot, you see PC1 on the x-axis and PC3 on the y, and uh, PC2 and PC3 are on the right. And again, different kind of, of smoothing. And again, you can argue um, whether uh, you should, for example, looking at, at this particular plot, say, oh, well, yeah, there are three maxima, or if you use more smoothing, uh, you may say there's just one, but clearly, what this show is that the structure is, is complex. So you don't have uh, the fact that these PCs are linearly uncorrelated doesn't mean that they are statistically independent. So in fact, if you just take basically a cross section along one particular value of one PC, the resulting PDF will be different. So this actually shows that the uh, attractor is more complex. And although uh, uh, there are issues of, how to compute and evaluate these modes. I think most people agree that the structure of the attractor is, is non-Gaussian. And <clears throat> so you can still look for um, areas of the attractor which are more populated. So one can generalize even further and say why only uh, use two. But then if you use more, more than two, it's difficult to compute um, an, a probability density function or even more difficult to visualize it. So then the approach is uh, to use a, a cluster analysis and the k-means method that Angel has um, uh, discussed in his lectures is one of the most uh, used approach. There are other uh, techniques um, that have been emerged. And if you actually look at the, uh, I, I, probably they are still on, on, on the web, the, uh, the presentation from uh, a school on, on flow regimes that we had uh, uh, I think three years ago here at ICTP, and there uh, there were many uh, new approaches to um, the uh, um, basically cluster analysis, hidden Markov chain, um, and uh, 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 yeah, uh, self-organizing maps, and a lot of other <coughs> modern statistical methods to perform the same. This, the k-means is very simple. It's easy to uh, understand, easy to code, and uh, uh, it's very good that you can actually uh, play with it on, on the lab. Now, when uh, this method has been applied either to um, hemispheric fields uh, or to uh, regional fields, uh, Usually, people tend to find three to four uh, regimes. For example, uh, Kimoto and Gill in 1993 uh, found four hemispheric regimes characterized by different uh, phases of the uh, Pacific North American and the North Atlantic oscillation patterns. So different combinations will give you these four regimes. 
if you look uh, on the Atlantic, these, these uh, regimes have already been shown <laughs> by uh, a number of uh, previous speakers. Uh, these are the maps from the Casu paper, but actually, uh, yeah, the, the paper which is usually referred to uh, is the one by Michelangelo et al. in 1995. One has to say that these were previously already found by Robert Votard in earlier uh, papers. And uh, in this case, uh, if you look at the top, the two regimes correspond to opposite phases of the North Atlantic Oscillation, which is the leading uh, EOF, and so there's, there's a counterpart in the hemispheric regimes. But then you, you find more uh, regional regimes. Uh, one uh, characterizes basically blocking situation uh, here over at the North Sea and Scandinavia. It's usually called Scandinavian blocking. And one corresponds to a, a very strong ridge in the middle of the Atlantic, and is uh, usually called the uh, Atlantic Ridge. So basically, the, you can use different degrees of freedom. If you just use one, well, it's very simple. You can do histograms, you can do PDFs. Uh, but then, of course, you have the disadvantage. You condense everything in just one number. You can use more numbers. You can use a wider face space um, to look at this um, at these regimes. So <clears throat> let's see. How we do. Um, now the point is, okay, if we want to use these regimes to understand the uh, basically the impact of an anomalous forcing like the one that can come from ENSO, come from NJO, as has been mentioned before. Uh, one has to think about, in general, what is the impact of an external forcing in nonlinear system? And you can may, maybe experiment with some very simple nonlinear system like the Lorentz uh, convection model in 1963. This is what is, was described in, in the paper by Palmer that Angel uh, mentioned uh, before and in, in other papers that we did with Laura. Um, and what actually comes out is that if you have a model with strong nonlinearities and flow regime and you basically apply uh, a small anomaly in, in the forcing pattern, usually what happens is that the regime structure is not changed very much, but what you change is the frequency of occurrence of, of this regime. For example, if you do it um, in, the, uh, in the simple Lorentz model, which has a symmetric attractor with two uh, regimes which are equally populated. You put a perturbation uh, in, in, in the x or y axis, and this will make one of these two wings of the attractor more densely populated than the other. But the structure of the attractor will basically remain the same. On the other hand, it's also well known that nonlinear system, in nonlinear system, the number of multiple stationary solutions depends may depend on a forcing parameter. So. You may, if you actually change the forcing parameter substantially, the system can go to what are called bifurcation points. So basically, points where the number of stationary solution changes. And so, even in the atmosphere, if you have some strong forcing anomaly, you can actually even modify the number or, or the patterns of, of these flow regimes. So can this concept be used uh, in uh, uh, for uh, long-range prediction, both intra-seasonal and, and seasonal. Uh, if you have enough data, you need to have large ensemble because these computations require a lot of data to get statistically significant results. Uh, but um, uh, in the mid-90s, when I still was here, there was a very uh, close cooperation with David um, at, at the time and, and Susanna Corti. And we looked to a very large set of uh, ensemble simulations made with the uh, uh, model of the Center for Ocean and Atmosphere Studies. Um, and we looked at the, uh, at the Pacific sector. We did a K-mean analysis. Uh, so we found uh, four uh, clusters uh, corresponding to different uh, basic intensity and position of, of, the, of uh, the planetary waves in the, in the Pacific North American sector. And uh, we computed the frequency for each winter uh, in the record. And then, basically, we, we try to um, actually see whether the observed frequency was somehow reproduced uh, by this ensemble. These ensembles were run with observed sea surface temperature. So basically, this was an experiment trying to see whether the perturbation induced by uh, different tropical sea surface temperature, for example, in Nino cases, um, 
could actually change the frequency of regimes and whether the model could reproduce that. And um, <clears throat> what we can actually see here, so the, the blue line is the observation, the red line is the ensemble mean, and the uh, green line is the spread uh, within the ensemble. And you can see that definitely for uh, some of the regime, especially this, this Pacific trough, that roughly corresponds to the positive phase of the PNA pattern, uh, you can clearly see that uh, the, the interannual variability of, of the frequency is, is strongly modulated uh, by the forcing, and it well, was well reproduced uh, by uh, the color general circulation model. Um, some variability also here in the, in the Arctic low for, for, for this period. Uh, some of the regimes, like for example here, the Arctic high, uh, little sign of, uh, of predictability. And that is a consequence of the fact that the teleconnections from ENSO would project preferentially of some regimes rather than others. Now, uh, th this particular set was, in fact, large enough. Uh, there were 55 members, if I remember correctly, for each year. And so what we actually did, we were actually able to do a cluster analysis for each single year. And in this k-means, basically, there's a simple parameter that tells you how strong the clustering is, so how well aggregated the points are. And this is basically the um, ratio between uh, the variance explained just by the cluster means and the internal variance of the cluster. So the larger is this number, so the more variance you just explain with the cluster mean, usually the higher is the significance of, of the clusterings. And uh, what we uh, did was actually to to compute that parameter for the classification uh, done uh, for each individual year. We just choose a partition in just three clusters. And uh, in the left diagram, you can see this number plotted against the Nino 3 SST anomaly in this one. And what you see is that there's clearly a, a negative correlation. So basically, this tells you that in the Pacific, the strength of the clustering. So the, actually the significance of these different regimes is actually stronger when you are in a La Nina situation. And progressively, when you have a La Nina case, the, the clusters tend to uh, sort of merge with, with, uh, with each other to the point that um, when you look at very strong El Ninos, and in this case, uh, these were 82, 83, and uh, 96, 97, in fact, the parameter become as small enough that the clusters are no longer significant. So this can be interpreted as an evidence for a bifurcation. You know, these extreme ENSO events create such a strong forcing for the planetary waves then somehow pushed all the system into one single cluster. There was no evidence within those seasons of a multiple existence of multiple uh, regimes. Uh, so in this case, this was done similarly, but in case uh, basically uh, plotting the data as a function of the first principal component uh, uh, of um, the North Pacific variability on the seasonal scale, which is actually the mean response to ENSO. So again, this gives the same message. Thank you. 
And now um, I would like to come back to what has been probably one of the main uh, issues in, in this school. So the relationship between, uh, you know, subseason of variability in the tropics, and specifically the uh, um, MJO, the phase of the MJO, and the uh, occurrence of uh, regimes in, in the North Atlantic. You have already seen this picture many times, so you know what, what it is. And um, so what I'm trying to propose is one possible interpretation of this dynamical link based on one category of uh, models uh, for flow regimes. Um, <clears throat> and in particular, I will use uh, the papers as a reference for a dynamical framework, the papers on thermal equilibration of planetary waves that basically describe the variability in the phase of planetary waves with respect to the surface temperature distribution. So uh, I already mentioned the Mitchell and the Rome paper, papers by Glenn Schatz and Marshall and, and so, um, uh, later on also uh, approached this, um, this problem. And <clears throat> somehow if one uh, looks at the ob in an observational counterpart for this theory, probably you know, one, what comes to the mind is the so-called cold ocean warm land pattern, a uh, pattern that was uh, described uh, empirically by Mike Wallace and, and collaborators in the mid-90s, uh, which is basically a pattern uh, which describes the variability of the large-scale um, atmospheric flow with respect to the surface, um, to the surface temperature. So the, in the sort of cold ocean phase, so you have cold air over the warm ocean during winter, the opposite phase will actually have warm air over, over the ocean. So uh, in, in, in a paper in 2001 that we did here with, with Fred, uh, David, and, and um, another colleague of ours, we, we try to relate basically the properties of uh, the cal pattern to the predictions of um, thermal equilibration using, using the speedy model. And we try to find a simple uh, index uh, that could somehow quantify these, uh, these interactions. And <clears throat> what we tried to do was actually, since one of the prediction of thermal equilibration theory is that the switching of the phase will actually change uh, this, the thermal forcing of the planetary waves. Because in one case, uh, if you put cold air over the, the oceans, which are relatively warm in winter, the difference in temperature would be very strong. You will have a lot of heat transfer from the ocean to the atmosphere. If you do the opposite, if you put the warm air over the ocean, then the difference is reduced and the fluxes are reduced. So we decided to use the surface heat fluxes as a measure of this transfer and to see how other variables uh, related to that. So we define an index, which is basically a, um, an index which is positive when you have a positive transfer of heat from the northern ocean to the atmosphere. So you have upward heat flux over the oceans and downward heat flux over the continent. The opposite phase is related to the so-called equilibrated phase where actually you have warm atmospheric anomaly located over the ocean so the fluxes are strongly uh, reduced. If you compute this particular index, for example, from uh, the IRA interim analysis uh, for each winter, uh, 82 to 2001, uh, you get quite a lot of uh, interannual variability, but also some decadal variability. You can see, for example, in the last 10 years or so, the, uh, the values are predominantly negative. The, um, the covariance of this index with geopotential height gives a, a very strong wave number two pattern. So we are expecting this. Uh, so in the positive phase, you actually have a low geopotential height over the ocean, and so cold, uh, lower tropospheric temperatures. And uh, you see here, basically, a strong um, North Atlantic oscillation signal. This is actually the map uh, associated with the uh, surface heat flux. In this case, it's defined positive downwards. So basically, this tells you that in the positive phase, the oceans are cooling because they are transferring heat to the atmosphere. Uh, 
in the northern latitudes and uh, some compensating warming uh, in the subtropics. So this is what you get um, from the observation. And so basically, you can say that this is the, uh, a pattern which is uh, just associated with different planetary wave configurations uh, related to a forcing which is actually originated in the extra tropics. Now you can take a different approach and go to the tropics and say, uh, well, uh, what about the forcing associated with these different heat sources along the equator? And this is a pattern that, again, was actually diagnosed from uh, the seasonal prediction. But actually, if you uh, look at the structure of the pattern in the um, Western Indian Ocean and over the maritime continent, it, this looks very much like some of the patterns you see in, uh, for example, phase two of the Madden and Julian uh, oscillation. So if we actually just focus on this region, which is actually a region which is important both for seasonal and uh, intra-seasonal variability, and we look at the at teleconnection with uh, geopotential height in the extra tropics, so you compute an index and you look at the covariance map with uh, this index once you standardize it, then uh, you get a pattern like this. Uh, and again, uh, you see uh, a low over the North Pacific and a positive uh, North Atlantic oscillation signal. So this is somehow consistent with some of these MJO teleconnections. So it tells you that if you have increased rainfall over the Indian Ocean drying, over the maritime continents and, and the West Pacific, <coughs> this will be associated with a positive phase of the North Atlantic oscillation. Now, if I actually show you the pattern that was in the previous slide, so the one that was actually associated with thermal forcing originated in the mid-latitudes, and if you compare these two maps, they clearly have quite a strong degree of, of similarity. And so somehow one way, one possible way of actually interpreting uh, this particular teleconnection is to say that some Rossby waves that will propagate from the tropics uh, into the mid latitudes will actually stabilize one of these two opposite uh, regimes of, of the planetary waves. So you have some source of forcing, which is the, the thermal contrast uh, in the extratropics. This may give different kind of equilibria. And what you do uh, when you change the forcing in the tropics, you send some signal in the extratropics that will push the system into one regime or the other regime. So this is uh, basically one, one example. One can find many others um, of how you can actually uh, use uh, the sort of simple linear teleconnection concepts uh, that uh, has been uh, used many times to study the impact of uh, tropical forcing on the extra tropics. Uh, you can actually relate it to, uh, to the variability that is actually originated by nonlinear dynamics uh, in, in the extra tropics. So, uh, we can come to, to the conclusion. So what we have seen is that circulation regimes represent an important dynamical feature of many nonlinear models of the atmospheric circulation. For regimes in the extratropical circulation, a balance occurs between the dynamical tendencies of the large scale flow and the nonlinear feedback from high frequency bioclinic waves. And that comes if you average on a time scale longer than uh, about 10 days. So this is a bit different from what Angel has shown, because you, of course you can use the cluster analysis to look to more sort of fine-grained structure uh, that, as uh, David mentioned, maybe are not so much related to this uh, large-scale equilibration, but on the other hand have the advantage that if you want to use them as predictor of local events, uh, then they will be more strongly correlated with uh, local phenomena. So you, you can use both, and Laura will, will also show in her lecture some examples of using these concepts on a larger scale to do prediction. So regimes have been detected in long records of either analysis or, or model data using one or two dimensional provisionality function or cluster analysis applied to either hemispheric or sectorial domain. The anomalous forcing, for example, from ENSO, the MJO can affect the property of regimes by modifying the frequency of occurrence if the forcing anomaly is not too strong or it can even 
change the number of regimes if the system goes across a bifurcation point. And, and if you have a large enough a set of model data, you can actually detect uh, both uh, kind of behavior. So as one example of these interactions between uh, signal uh, propagating from the tropics to the extratropics and this interaction with the regimes, uh, I've shown you this example of basically looking at the pattern that uh, basically is associated with uh, different um, uh, phases of the planetary waves as a response to thermal forcing. And you can actually see that the forcing originated from the Indian Ocean and uh, the maritime continent actually has a quite strong projection on these particular patterns. As I said, this is one example, and uh, you can find many others, but I think that uh, for this morning, uh, we stop here. Thank you.